known for being high church. There are things about high church that I like. I do like a little incense, especially if my room smells a little musty. I, I do like some robes on a pretty choir. I like the, the, the Messiah, the musical. I mean, the, the stuff the thing Handel wrote. I, I like a lot of things like that. But um, we're pretty low church. It's called low church where we kind of toss things together. Sometimes a little more impromptu, a little more earthy, a little more real, a little less pomp and circumstances and makeup and polish. And so I'm saying all that just to make excuses for my message. I wish I had more time to prepare it. I had about five different ones I wanted to preach this morning. But I, I took a weird uh, turn, and that was that I, I took an interest in Advent. Yes, Advent is a high church tradition. You probably won't find it in Scripture. Advent just means coming, but there's candles with it. And I don't, you'll probably have a hard time finding those candles in the Bible, but they do stand for things that are in the Bible, and that's important. And um, so the candles, are all, they're almost all purple, but there is a white one. That's the Christmas candle. You like that one on, on Christmas Eve. But the first, the first Sunday of Advent is actually today. Did you know it? No, because you're from the Calvary Chapel movie. But it is. Today is the first Sunday of Advent and has a purpose. I'm going to be preaching on an Old Testament text. It's Isaiah chapter 52 through 53. And I'd rather you not follow on your phone because you can only see two or three verses on your phone. So if you got, and I want you to see the bigger picture. So if you got out of the house without a Bible today and you'd like one so that you can see these two chapters together, which would be really helpful for you. Just slip up your hand. We'll give you a Bible. we got Bibles. We've got the Bible man back there. He's got more Bibles he's carrying around. He's a weightlifter. Look, we've got three up front, Trent. Don't forget those. It's a Trinitarian. Anybody else? We've got Bibles. Happy to get them into your hands. Um, okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about Advent before we actually turn to the passage, but we'll be in the, in the book of Isaiah mainly today. Um, so if you can find that in the Old Testament, you pretty much go at the half and part it. You might find yourself in Psalms. Go forward a few to um, Isaiah. But anyway, here's what caught my attention. I don't know if you know this about me, Joe Whitchurch, but I actually enjoy, well, I really enjoy the Old Testament, but I also enjoy Bible prophecy, and the Old Testament's full of Bible prophecy. And the first candle of Advent is the prophecy candle. So I'm thinking, yeah, this is the first Sunday of Advent. It's prophecy. Let's do something with prophecy. So I got real excited about that. But here's where it kind of goes a little bit nuts. I decided, because I, I just had a vague memory that that first candle was the prophecy candle, but I really didn't know. And I thought, what has the church historically taught related to Advent, related to the first candle, the prophecy candle? Because I remember there was an angel candle, there was a shepherd candle, there was a, uh, the white purity Christmas candle. Which one is the prophecy candle? I thought it was the first one, but I didn't know for sure. So I Googled it. Yes, I did. I used Google for sermon preparation. And um, so when I was looking at Google, I did a search. I said, what is the, um, the first candle stand for what is because i want to be sure i was right about it and oh my looks like my thing is not coming up. there it is okay so let's see if my advancer works next next it's not working somebody may have to do a next for me it's a nexus or a, a nexus do i need to reload it candle there we go no it's dark we're in the dark uh, advance again there it is all right so Prophecy talks about a lot of things. Creation, the fall into sin, uh, prophecies of first coming of Jesus, second coming, prophecies of the incarnation. God become man. God takes on flesh, incarnates. That's celebrated Christmas. The atonement, the resurrection, Easter, Pentecost, the second coming. All these events are prophesied, and they're given to us so that we might have joy and peace, and realize that our God is sovereign, and he gives us hope and comfort and confidence. And when I was coming into church for the first service this morning, I talked to somebody, a friend, and she said, how are you feeling this morning? And I said, frazzled. 
And she said, I think a lot of people are frazzled coming off of the holidays. And uh, so I thought about that, and I thought, well, maybe this prophecy thing would be good for us in terms of getting settled in. Now, I know you can't see all the prophecies on that text wheel there, but the prophecies for Jesus are very many of them. They'd be born of a virgin or the seed of woman, and, uh, and there are other prophecies there. We could look at all of them. He'd be from uh, the line of Jacob, not Esau. Um, Joseph is a type of Christ in the Old Testament in terms of the suffering servant. And then we've got this thing in, in uh, Genesis chapter 5 where all the names in Hebrew in chronological order, each word has a meaning. I know you know that Adam means man, right? Uh, but if you look at the meanings of these words and just read them through in, in order, you'll see a gospel message on the right side. Man is appointed mortal sorrow. The blessed God... Mahalalel, oh, the blessed God, shall come down teaching. His death shall bring the despairing comfort, rest, global shalom. Isn't that interesting? Oh, things are prophesied in Scripture in strange ways. This is another one. This comes from a book by Geisler and Turek that we apologists use a lot. Apologists are people who give a reason for the truthfulness of the Christian worldview and, and the lordship of Christ. And these are some prophecies about Jesus. You can't prophesy where you're going to be born unless you pre-existed. And since we don't pre-exist, we came into being when the sperm and the egg came together and there was a unique DNA. But Jesus' birthplace was, was prophesied, what people would do over his garments. When he would enter into Jerusalem in the triumphal entry is prophesied in the weeks of years in Daniel's uh, prophecy. We could look at all those things, but I thought we'd look at something else instead. So here's my Google search. I did a screen capture of it. And it's kind of hard to read, so I'm going to strain my eyes to see it. Oh, thank you, Brad. You're a saint. Dude, he not only leads worship, but he zooms. How wonderful is that? So I did a search. What do we? What is the first prophecy candle? What do they talk about in Christendom? You know, lots of different denominations, a lot of different religious traditions. What do they talk about for the Advent, the first candle, the prophecy candle? And here's what it said. The first Sunday of Advent is considered the most important of all the four Advent Sundays. And that's today. <laughs> and you didn't know. But anyway, we're here and we're doing it. Because it is when preparations for Christmas and the Advent of Jesus begin. I don't like it when he asks for what do they do on Advent and they use Advent in the definition. Well, the Advent is when you get ready for Advent to begin. Oh, thank you so much. What is the definition of truck? Well, it's a truck. Oh, that's, that's good. Well, for truck, I know what a truck is. But, anyway, but look at this last part. And I, I underscored it in red because I was so shocked by it when I read it. It says, this is the day when people start looking forward to the second coming of Christ. Oh. And I thought to myself, I know in the Calvary Chapel movement, conservative Baptist, some of the of God, free church, some other, other evangelical movements that we look forward to the second coming of Christ because we call it the blessed hope. We want him to come. We love him. He's our first love. We want to see him. We're ready to meet him. Oh, did I say ready? Yeah, we are ready to meet him. And we're excited about it. But... Um, this is the day when people start looking forward to the second coming of Christ. I don't know about you, but that's not my experience with most of Christendom. It's not. If I talk to people from different denominational backgrounds and say something about the second coming of Christ, they'll look at me with that look that says, why are you trying to be controversial? Or if I say something about, are you excited about the second coming of Christ? They'll look at me and say something like, why are you wanting to talk about the end of the world? Or I talked to them, are you eager to see Jesus when he comes? I said, no, I'm actually eager to study for this exam. Right now I'm kind of wrestling with things. So I have a video for you because I think it's good for us to start looking forward to the second coming of Christ because it's a blessed hope. And he that has that, our hope fixed on Christ and his coming purifies himself even as Christ is pure. First John tells us, Titus tells us it's a blessed happy hope. Thessalonians tells us to comfort one another with these words that we're part of that generation that's alive and remain to the coming of the Lord, that we'll be caught up to meet him in the air, that we should comfort each other with these words. And I just think, ah, oh, looking forward to the second coming of Christ. So it's kind of like the Super Bowl. Uh, eschatology is the doctrine of last things. 
And it's all that teaching that happens after you die and what goes on into the future. And we tend to take the Bible pretty literally. And there's a lot of stuff that goes on into the future. But the Super Bowl, some people say the Super Bowl is just who won the final game, this touchdown, right? But the Super Bowl is more than that. It's the full game. It's who wins the Lombardi, Lombardi trophy. Those of you who know I'm a Packer fan, know Vince Lombardi. Anyway, moving on. It's all the events before the Super Bowl. It's the playoffs. It's, it's the merch they sell. It's the, it's the commercials. People go berserk over the commercials. The whole thing is the Super Bowl. And so the second coming of Christ in most people's mind, um, they don't conflate. They do conflate everything. They say it's all just the end of the world. And that's the way they look at it, and that's why they don't want to talk about it. But if you say, no, no, it's when Christ comes for his church and we're caught up to meet him in the air and then there's righteous judgment on the earth when the seals and the trumpets blow and everything and then Christ returns to earth to reign and then it morphs into the new heavens and the new earth. And by the way, if that all sounds complicated to you and you're a believer in Christ, here's the, here's the shorthand. When you die, you go into God's happy presence forever. You might get to commute down to millennial earth. You're going to see the morphing into the new heavens earth. You might see Ezekiel's temple. Oh, my, you're going to see streets of gold. There's all kinds of wonderful things. The main thing you're going to see is Jesus. And that's going to be a happy, glad day for sure. A happy, glad day for sure. But for most people, when you talk about getting ready for the second coming of Christ, they're not eager for it. They're not eager for it. They got a kind of dread for it. So I've got this thing by is it Morgan Freeman put it together for National Geographic. It's about three and a half minutes. And if you look in the upper left hand corner, it will tell the country of the person speaking. And they're speaking in their own language a lot of times. So you got to read the text below. But this is what people around the globe think about when they think about the second coming or the end of the world. And I want to tell you, it's not a happy stuff. And second of all, some of it sounds like suicide is the most scientific. Isn't that disgusting? And some of it's a little loopy. They talk about zombies. And, and one of the things in there is actually right on. And that actually sounds the most goofy. But anyway, <laughs> you know how they do things? Uh, uh, there used to be a saying. I think a guy's name was Steve Taylor. He was a contemporary Christian musician. He wrote a song, A Christian Can't Get Equal Time Unless He's a Loony Committing a Crime. Uh, <laughs> Well, this, this, just see what you think of this, this video. I'll, I'll key it up for you, or, or uh, Brad will. Uh, next.
and down. It's, if you ask the question, you're not alone. Lots of people are dealing with the question, and what they need to know is the God who knows the beginning from the end. So if you turn to Isaiah chapter 52, I'm sorry, but you've got to turn back to Isaiah chapter 46 just briefly. So keep your finger in 52 and turn back to 46 and verse 9 and 10. This is Yahweh speaking through the prophet Isaiah. Remember the former things. This is Isaiah 46.10. Remember the former things, those of long ago. I am God, and there is no other. That means there's just one God, the God of the Bible, no other. God exists in three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, but one God, and there is no other. There is none like me. I make known the end from the very beginning. From the beginning. He knows the whole deal. He's outside time. He knows everything. What is everything? He knows everything. He knows what you're thinking about when I say everything. He knows everything about you, everything about history, and he knows it with perfect knowledge. And if somebody insulted him, he, does, he isn't jaded by it in terms of his knowledge, but he knows what's going on, the full story, perfectly. I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come. I say... My purpose will stand, and I will do all that I please, talking about the Lord God. Isn't that amazing? Our God knows the future. That's why the Bible has prophecy, and we get to read it. And it's not like Nostradamus, and it's not like a horoscope, and it's not something so general like, uh, today you're going to have a day. Oh, yeah, look what it says. My, my fortune cookie says, today you're going to have a day. Yeah, right? We're all going to have a day unless we die, and then we didn't have the day, and then it was wrong. Anyway, back to chapter 52, some real prophecy written in Scripture. This actually was part of the Masoretic text. It's a Hebrew Old Testament, and our oldest Masoretic text was hundreds and hundreds of years after the time of Christ. And we did have an older, older translation of the Old Testament. It's called the Septuagint, written in Greek. Um, written closer to the time of Christ. But with the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, we discovered Hebrew manuscripts that predate the time of Christ by a couple hundred years. And one of them is the Isaiah Scroll, where we could do a whole message on prophecies just in Isaiah alone, going through prophecies of Jesus that are outstanding. But we're going to look at this one because it's a fun one to look at. So all that just to say, let's read what the scriptures have to say, starting with the suffering servant discourse in verse 13. See my servant, he will act wisely. He will be raised up and lifted up and highly exalted. Just take a little pause there. This is talking about the suffering servant, but it's saying my servant is a he, and he is going to be exalted. And if the Lord God, the creator of the universe, says somebody is going to be exalted, he's not talking about your kid's first birthday party where you got those things from the dollar store that go, and the little thing comes out and back in, and the kid puts, your face, puts his face in the birthday. He's talking about exaltation from God the Father, from eternity past, the prophecy, an exalted Jesus Christ. Look what else it says, though. It comes in. Just as there were many who were appalled at you, or at him it could be translated. His appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any man, and his form marred beyond human likeness. Now tonight, 6 o'clock, we celebrate communion here at the ser at uh, Harvest. It's a body life service. It's got to exercise the spiritual gifts. It's really a cool service. If you can come out, I think you'd enjoy it. But this is talking about the atonement of Christ. His marred body, his appearance so disfigured, his appearance marred beyond human likeness. Pastor Tom Camp, who, by the way, is doing well, he's still recovering well, he's following the doctor's orders and staying off that foot, and he's healthy. And, uh, but uh, Tom Camp is fond of saying, well, he's probably fond is probably not the right word for it, but when he talks about the Jesus experiencing the scourging on his back, the cat of nine tails, the crown of thorns shoved down on his head, and the brutalities of being spit on and beat by fists, his beard plucked out by soldiers, that this text really describes it really well. He says um, his body resembled 
probably looked more like a large piece of hamburger than it looked like human. And verse 15, it goes on to say, so he, the suffering servant, will sprinkle many nations, many ethnic affinity groups from all around the world, and kings will shut their mouth because of him. Kings. You know, we, we tend to spiritualize and sentimentalize this stuff. We talk about, well, when do the kings ever shut their mouths because of Jesus? You know, they're talking about politics. They're talking trash. They're talking launching intercontinental ballistic missiles over the, the Sea of Japan all the time. They're, they're talking about their great technologies and how powerful they are. And um, When do they ever be quiet and listen to Jesus? Well, here's the way they spiritualize it. They say, well, when Jesus was born, the three magi came. Those were wise philosophers from the area of Iran. Oh, no, they were three kings. And they were startled, and they were made, well, kind of. <laughs> but it's not the exaltation that the passage is talking about that God says will happen to his servant. Not the global exaltation, and not the shutting of the mouth. You know, we don't even have an account of Jesus appearing before Caesar. The apostle Paul made an appeal to Caesar. He wanted to go to Romans, talk of Jesus to Caesar. About as far up the food chain we get is to Pontius Pilate. Um, but still, we know from the book of Philippians that there were people who were part of Caesar's Praetorian Guard. Did I say Ephesians? It's in Philippians. The Praetorian Guard heard the news about Jesus, and some of them believed. That's pretty close to a king, but this says kings will shut their mouth because we're still talking about the big picture. The God of glory became human in the person of Jesus Christ. It's an amazing thing. Uh, it's way bigger than what we think. It's bigger than that last scene of Men in Black. Where, do you remember the last scene of Men in Black? Some of you remember. Where they back off the universe to the solar system, to the Milky Way galaxy, to other galaxies, to far distant uh, quasars and so forth. And eventually you get so, back so far, you get to see an alien with long fingers shooting marbles with the various universes or something. This is the God who is outside the universe, that created the whole thing, that sees it all in one glance, that knows everything, enters into human history. This is an amazing thing we celebrate. It's called the incarnation. God became man. It's powerful. And the implications here early on in the servant psalm is it's going to affect the kings. They're going to shut their mouths because of him. I once saw a skit by some people called Jesus People USA. Perhaps you've heard of them. They used to have a magazine called uh, Cornerstone. And uh, so they did a skit with an alien. Okay, it wasn't really a, a real alien, like from outer space and ET. It was somebody playing the part of an alien. And the way the skit goes is this arrogant earth dweller is bragging about all of our great technology. You know, our great surveillance technology, our great smartphones, all these wonderful things that we can do. And the alien is totally unimpressed. Totally unimpressed. That, that technology is so old. That, oh, that is so, this, this planet, why am I even here? This place is so backward. You know, he goes on and on. And the, the guy from Earth is trying to, trying to impress him by all these wonderful things we've done that are just so, in the alien's mind, it's like prehistoric. It's like caveman stuff. And finally, the guy lets it slip out in the skit. This is a skit. He lets it slip. Oh, they say God came here. To this, the alien gets very excited. He says, God, you're talking about the God who created the whole universe, everything, all the galaxies outside of space and time, the God who's all wise and magnificent and wonderful. He came here to this dump, to this place. You're telling me he actually came here? What did you do? Did all the kings come out? Did they roll out the red carpet? Did people sit under his teaching? What did they do? What did they do? He said, we crucified him. That's the end of the skit. So you're supposed to sit and think about that. The great God comes down like a funnel to the center of human history in the cross. It's all there. It's the gospel. It's the good news. And... And for some of us, it just hits us like Teflon. It just rolls off our back, and we don't even think about its significance or its beauty or its power or its wonder. This is a time to reverse that and to start thinking about the wonderfulness of the gospel. Let's read on in our text. 
about why they shut their mouths because of him. Second part of verse 15. For what they were told, excuse me, for what they were not told, they will see. And what they have not heard, they will understand. There's a passage in Revelation chapter 1 that says they will look on him who they pierced and they will mourn for the loss of an only son. There's a day coming when people are going to know that Jesus Christ is Lord and they're going to confess it to the glory of God the Father. Now here's another zoomer in her. And this passage is uh, 53 verse 1. Let's see if I can get my phone advancer on again because I might be missing something here a little bit. Let's see. Okay, yeah. Oh, let's go back to a little bit about the day when people look forward to the second coming of Christ. At the second coming of Christ, the kings are going to shut their mouth because of him. <laughs> and they're going to know the truth that Jesus is Lord. But how do people look forward to the second coming of Christ? I think the trick is, how do you define the word second coming of Christ? And I hate to say it, but a lot of the church spiritualizes second coming. Now, here's the truth. Jesus in Acts chapter 1 was ascended before the disciples and they saw him go up. They saw, and he was caught up into a cloud. And the angel says to the disciples, don't stand here looking into the clouds. The same Jesus is going to come back the same way you saw him go up in his physical, bodily, resurrected body. But here's the way people will talk about preparing for the second coming of Christ. And by the way, I really love this hymn. O come, O come, Emmanuel and ransom captive Israel, who dwells in lowly exile here, until the Son of Man appears, till the Son of God appears. Rejoice, rejoice, O Emmanuel, come to thee, O Israel. They look at Israel, not as that piece of property in the Middle East, which is a miracle they exist since 1948. It's a miracle they have Jerusalem as their capital since 1967. But they look at Israel as their own broken and wounded self. So they say, oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel, to me this Christmas and help me get through the brokenness of my family and my illness and my sorrows and my sickness. Redeem me from Satan's power, Satan's tyranny, and I'll rejoice, oh, rejoice, oh, Emmanuel, you've come to ransom captive Israel. They think they're Israel. Well, I... There's truth to this. There's application for this. We need Jesus' presence in our life. We need his healing touch. We need his comfort. We need his truth. We need his teaching and correction. We need him. Totally need him. Um, but that's not the second coming of Jesus Christ. Not as described by the angels to the 12 disciples on, at the ascension in, um, in Acts chapter 1. So what's another way that we tend to look at this business of the second coming of Christ? Well, this one is very popular among scholars today. It's called preterism. You can forget the word preterism, but uh, I'll just tell you the description of it. It basically goes like this. In the year 70 AD, after most of the New Testament was written, maybe even all of it, um, the Roman army came down on Jerusalem and they destroyed the Jews' temple. And when the Roman army was coming, their chariots and their horses made so much dust in the sky that it was like clouds. And see, God was judging the Jewish people. This is not my theory. This is preterism. Judging the Jewish people for rejecting their Messiah. And that was the second coming of Christ. Well, <clears throat> there's similarities in the sense that there's judgment, but it's not the second coming of Christ. It's not. The second coming of Christ is as described in Acts chapter 1. So, even though I rejoice about that definition, I wonder what they mean by the second coming of Christ. I wonder if they mean that the kings will shut their mouths because they will know what they were not told. They will know the atoning sacrifice of the servant king and they will exalt him and lift him up highly because God says that's going to happen. But let's read on in our text to Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 1. And before we do, let me tell you a little story. <laughs> When I was a young Jesus freak, became a Christian my freshman year in college, I was hitchhiking to Rock Valley Junior College because the apartment I was in, I didn't have a car. And um, so I, I had this, it was, it's cold in the wintertime when you hitchhike to school. And, and I had this jacket, it was army surplus. You get a good deal on it, real, real warm, real cheap. Green, it had a liner in it, real warm. But I took a black magic marker 
And on the back of my army surplus jacket, I drew a large Star of David. Took up the whole back sleeve of the jacket. And in the middle of the Star of David, I put a gigantic cross. And over the top of it, I wrote, Who has believed our report? I love this passage of scripture. <laughs> it's been with me for a while. It sticks to me. I, I, I can't get beyond it. It's just so amazing. The arm of the Lord. What is the arm of the Lord? Well, it talks about it in chapter 52, verse 10. The Lord will lay bare his holy arm in the sight of all the nations. What is a holy arm that God has laid bare before all the nations? Well, I'll give you a little hint. One of the symbols for the arm of the Lord in Hebrew is the small Hebrew letter Yod. It's the smallest letter in the Hebrew alphabet. It's so small it doesn't touch the bottom line if you're writing on a ledger, and it, it hangs in space. It doesn't touch the top line either. And people tease about it and say, well, that's the arm of the Lord. It's so short it cannot save. It's the first letter in the name Yahweh, in the divine name, the Yod. And his holy arm that he laid bare before all the nations is God in his weakness. In his weakness is more powerful than everything else. It's, it's, it's a chiasm. It's a chiastic structure where you start out wide. The God of creation, beyond creation, steps into time, humbles himself, becomes a man, born with that animal feeder thing, and then the word goes out to the ends of the earth, to the church, through the gospel spreading to all nations through missions and God getting his property back, answering the Lord's prayer literally, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The earth is the Lord's, the fullness thereof. He's getting his stuff back. And I'm looking forward to it, and I hope you are too. And looking forward to the new heavens and new earth as well. But look what happens here in chapter 53 and verse 2. Talking about that servant of the Lord, that arm, that bared arm before the nations. He grew up before him like a tender shoot. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? We go from the macro, the huge picture of God and his glory, down to a tender shoot. What could be more of a tender shoot than the birth of a newborn baby? What about the birth of a sinless newborn baby? That doesn't have Adam's sin nature. He's the last Adam. What about the birth of of the Messiah, vastness confined in the womb of a maid, the Virgin May, Mary, having the God of the universe in the second person of the Trinity in her womb, giving birth to this child. Talk about a tender shoot. Talk about growing up before God, but growing up and never sinning. Never sinning. It's amazing. He's like a tender shoot like a root out of dry ground. He has no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. And now it goes on to talk about the atonement. Back to the atonement we've already talked about earlier, about the hamburger, right? marred image, sprinkling with blood, these kinds of things. So here it is. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. But surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken by God, smitten by God, and afflicted. Just take a pause on that. A lot of people that are anti-supernatural stuff in the Bible, like prophecy about the cross, will say, this man was just a man that had leprosy. See, he took up our infirmities. He carried our sorrow. It's like he had leprosy. Well, there's a sense in which they're right because leprosy is a type of sin in the Bible. It will eventually kill us. It dehumanizes us. It uh, mars our image. Uh, people want to stay away from us because we're affected by sin. When we, we behave sinfully, people don't want to hang, hang around us. And we're insensitive to sin and to God's Holy Spirit. That's why God says we need a circumcised heart. But there's no indication that Jesus had leprosy. He took the sins of the world, past, present, and future, all into his body on the tree. We'll look at that a little bit later. But we did esteem him that he was getting what was coming to him. They the Jews wouldn't have said it, but people today would say it must have been bad karma, right? That he would get crucified like that. But look at verse 5. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. 
the punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? I mean, that, that is just, that is amazing. That is, that is speaking the Hebrew language of atonement. There has to be a Passover lamb that is offered for the sins of the nation. But Jesus is the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, of the world. He was pierced for our sins, basically, our transgressions, our iniquities. He was punished for them. Propitiation is a word people don't like to use, but it is true. This is the John 3.16 of the Old Testament, Isaiah 53.6. Read on with me. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and Yahweh, the Lord in all caps there, has laid on him, Jesus Christ on the cross, the iniquity of us all. You know, it's the center of the Torah. You got Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. The center book of the Torah is Leviticus. The center chapters of the Torah are about the Day of Atonement, about the scapegoat. This is the atonement. This is what Judaism doesn't have today because they don't have a temple. It's the most important thing. It's the center of all history. It's why we worship on Sunday because Jesus died and he rose again on the Lord's day. And we're celebrating it today as well as celebrating the first Sunday of Advent, which is the prophecy Sunday. See where we're going here? See how this envelope's in? Just, just to recap a little bit. Pretty fun. Okay, verse 7. He was oppressed. This is real oppression, folks. When you're sinless, when you're righteous, when you're just, and you don't get a fair trial. He was afflicted, beat up by soldiers, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was stricken. Just take a pause there just to say he was dead. This is not somebody that's suffering with leprosy and then they get better. This is not somebody that's having a, a very bad, terrible, no good, very bad day like Alexander, even in Australia. But this is somebody that's actually dead. Look, he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people. He was stricken. He's a sacrifice. He's an atonement. The sin of the world is laid out. This is a sac sacrificial system. Verse 9, he was assigned a grave with the wicked. That means he was crucified between two wicked people who deserved to die on the cross on Calvary. And with the rich in his death, he was buried in a rich man's tomb. Joseph of Arimathea provided the tomb. Though he had done no violence, neither was any deceit found in his mouth. If you want to reference a New Testament quote of this, and it's the whole these two chapters are quoted all over the place in the New Testament. But 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 22 says, He never sinned and that he never did any violence. Two, two verses later in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, it says, He himself, referring to Jesus, bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sin and live for God, for by his stripes we have been healed. These things are prophesied way in advance, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, before the time of Christ. This is evidence for the truthfulness of the Christian worldview, the Christian faith, but more importantly, the Christ, the Messiah, Jesus. He's true. He is the Savior. There is only one Savior, just as there is only one God who knows the past and the future, and your past and your future as well. The sinless atoning sacrifice, the spotless Lamb of God, Verse 10, yet it pleased the Lord, Yahweh, to crush him, to cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, we'll take a pause there, okay? So it's saying Yahweh, the God of the Bible, was pleased to have Christ die and take the penalty for our sins. And though, it make, and though the Lord makes his life, Jesus' life, a guilt offering, this is the language of the sacrificial system. He's paying the price for our sin. He's taking the sin into, the, into his body to take it away from us. This is so weird, isn't it? I mean, John says this. He was the light, 
And he was coming into this dark world, but the darkness couldn't comprehend it. They couldn't overwhelm it. The light breaks out. Looks like the, the darkness wins, right? Because at the atonement of Christ, when he dies on the cross, what happens? Darkness. Lots of darkness. The light of the world went out. But not for long. Are you following with me in the verse? We're in verse 10. Though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. How did that happen? How did that happen? He was dead, dead, dead. He was the, the Lamb of God that had the, the iniquity laid on him in verse 10. He was a sheep before the shears. The sheep were getting slaughtered. He was cut off out of the land of the living. Verse 8, the Lord crushed him. If the Lord crushes you, you're dead. Dead, dead, dead. The guilt offering. But he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. I'll tell you what happened, and I know it's not right to say it, but Easter happens. <laughs> he resurrects. He does not stay die, dead, and it is not a near-death experience. He's not on a hospital table with people going around him, and his heart stopped for a while, and now he's back, and he had a vision of floating around the room or something. This is a guy that looked brutalized. Again, the hamburger image. When he appears to his disciples, they say, my Lord and my God, he's totally restored in his new body. He's got wounds here, here, and in his side. Amazing, still visible, but so glorious that they want to worship him on the spot. This Jesus resurrects, and this resurrection is prophesied at the end of verse 10. And in case you miss it, he keeps on going, keeps on going. The will of the Lord will prosper in his hand, the end of verse 10. What is the will of the Lord? We already talked about it, didn't we? The earth is the Lord's, the fullness thereof. He's going to get his property back. He's going to reign on the earth for a thousand years. He's going to morph it into a new heavens, a new earth. He wants the gospel taken to all people. He wants everybody to confess Jesus Christ as Lord to the glory of Father. He wants us to bow our knees now and gladly confess him as Lord and to confess him before people and to know the joy of the Lord, to know the power of his resurrection, the fruit of his spirit, and make a difference in this world on a mission like we're going to hear about from the moons. Moon Mission, not the Moonies. Their last name is Moon. They went to uh, Myanmar, which is pretty close to Outer Mongolia, in case you ever thought you might get called to a ministry in Outer Mongolia. Anyway, verse 11. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. The suffering servant, I'm reading from the NIV here, will see the light of life and be satisfied. This is not in some of your English translations because the phrase light of life is actually found in the Dead Sea Scrolls Hebrew text on this scripture. But doesn't that make sense? Jesus is the light of the world. He's been dead. He's been put in a rich man's tomb. The stone's been rolled over. Dark, dark, dark. And now he's alive with an unconquerable life to live forever, to get his stuff back, take out the mission's message to the ends of the earth. And he is going to see the light of life. By his knowledge, knowledge about him, about Jesus, my righteous servant, my just servant is going to be justifying many people. And he will bear their iniquities. He did it once and for all at the cross. Verse 12, therefore I will give him a portion among the great. Some people translate that word many, but great, powerful people. This word, this gospel is going out. Kings, as has already been stated earlier in the passage, will shut their mouths because of him. It's going out global again. It's going in from creation. The creator comes down to the manger, but it's going out globally now to everyone. Divide it with the Great, and he will divide the spoils, that's the spoils of war, with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death, death, and was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many, and he made intercession for the transgressors. This, my friends, is wonderful, wonderful, great news. It's called the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ in the Old Testament, prophesied in a living color for us. I'm going to put up another slide here and just see if I can bring this up. I don't know if the screen's dead or not, but we'll give it a shot. There we go. So I have the chiastic structure here for you. Of uh, This is the, the chiastic structure. It's an hourglass. Do you see how creation is out on the edge and millennium is, and new creation is out on the edge? 
That's the, uh, the top and the bottom of the hourglass. And the middle is the focus point where all the sand passes through. So we start in God's redemptive history with creation, right? And then there's the fall into sin. And there's a global flood. And then God has a new covenant people called Israel. He gives them the law and he gives them prophecies. And then we get the center of history at the cross of Jesus Christ, the resurrection, the ascension, and then Pentecost. And then we get God's new covenant people, the church, Jews and Gentiles alike, male and female, slave and free, all one in Christ Jesus through a living faith in Jesus as Lord, Savior, resurrected Lord, soon coming King. And then that goes out to the ends of the earth, and then we have the rapture of the church. We're caught up to meet the Lord in the air. It's called the blessed hope in Titus 2. It's called the great snatching away in Thessalonians that we're supposed to comfort one another with these words. It's called that, that day in 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. That, Beloved, it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know when Christ appears, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is, and those that have this hope fixed on him, Christ and his appearing, his return, glad to see that second coming, purify themselves even as he is pure. Um, and then what happens? Global tribulation. Global tribulation. Right back, see how that dovetails with the top one there? The global flood. Now we've got global tribulation. We got the seven seals, we got the seven trumpets, we got the seven bowls. God's pouring out his wrath on the earth through Christ. And then it morphs into the millennial kingdom. Christ reigned upon the earth for a thousand years, which morphs into the new heavens and the new earth or the new creation. And that goes right back to the creation story. You see the hourglass? You see, I hope you see it. It's really cool. It's one of the reasons why I think heaven has streets of gold. Because I think we're going to commute. I know the minute we die, we're, if we're a believer, you're in God's presence. And that's probably as much as maybe you can handle today. I don't know. And to not know him is to be separated from him for an eternity. And that's bad news. And that's probably bad enough to go into without going into all the thorny details. But <laughs> this, this good news is, is really wonderful. It's part of the reason I said I think we have translucent streets of gold. Because I think there's going to be a hovering of the new Jerusalem. I think we're going to be in heaven. Christ said, if I go away, I will come again to receive you unto myself, that where I am, you may be also. There's a Father's house. He's preparing a place for us to take us to it. We're above. But the earth and the millennial kingdom are below. But Christ is, the, the Ezekiel temple is there. And, and I think we're going to commute. I think it's going to be outstanding. I think there's not going to be any tears or sorrow. I think it's going to be glorious. I am looking forward to the second coming of Christ, and I'm so glad Google gave me permission to mention it to you this morning. Aren't you so glad? Glad the algorithms didn't catch that one, you know, to just, you know, keep us from being radical or something like that. But, yeah, he's coming, and it's a great thing. And I want to look, look at a song that we sang here, uh, my wife and some of you, folks uh, sang in the in the choir on this. It's got some words to it. And and here it is. I think it gives the picture in a different way. And it's written by Andrew Peterson. Is he worthy? And here's the words. Do you feel the world is broken? Well, do you? This time after Thanksgiving, when you read the newspaper and you watch North Korea and China and our own country and the, the f definitions of fairness and so forth. I mean, goodness. Do you feel the broke, world is broken? We do. Yeah, we do. We feel, it's bro we feel we're broke. Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. Do you, do you feel that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? We do. Do you wish that you could see it all made new? Somebody say, we do. We do. That's right. Is all creation groaning? Well, it sure is, right? It's a, a, Romans chapter 8. It's groaning. Is a new creation coming? It is, right? Is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst? Go ahead and say it. Yes. It is. Is it good that we remind ourselves of this? Yeah, I need to be reminded. Believe me, for getting together with different people over the holidays and seeing the, the wintry weather coming in and do I have a perma seal and is the heater going to work and what about the fridge and what about the supply line? That's good that we remind ourselves of this. It is. And then this one, right? I, I got Before I tell you this last stanza, I got to tell you a story about a, a friendly acquaintance of mine. I've met her twice. Her name's Rebecca Manley Pippert. She went to the University of Illinois. She's, she was on the student leadership team with the guy that brought me on staff with InterVarsity. And she was an international student studying in Spain. 
And she tells a story about witnessing to a Marxist. And he, she, she asks the Marxist this question, what is the human problem? Why can't we get our act together? And the Marxist gives this answer. I think the basic human problem is this. It's universal greed and selfishness. And Becky Pipper thought, that, that is a pretty biblical answer and a good definition of sin, really. Um, and so she pondered it, and she thought, I'm going to ask him another question. So she said, if universal greed and selfishness is the problem, what do you think is the answer? What is the solution? And he said, probably because he was a student, and she was a student, and they were all in education, that the answer is education. Answer, and Becky says, education is a really good thing. But you said that the greed and the selfishness are universal. It gets us all. If it's universal greed and universal selfishness, who's going to teach the class? Who's going to teach the class? Back to the song. Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to take the seal and open the scroll? Take a little pause on that just to mention that's just the language of, of Revelation chapter 6. The Lamb of God, there's... It starts out with 50 different descriptions of Jesus in Revelation 1. Then you go to the seven churches of Revelation, which Brad preached one Sunday through all seven of them in one message. And then chapter 4 and chapter 5 is the throne room scene of God where they're looking for someone that can pour out righteous judgment on earth, which starts with the breaking of the seals in chapter 6. And they're having a hard time finding somebody. Finally, they find somebody. He's called the Lamb of God. He's also called the Lion of the tribe of Judah. And here it is here. Is anyone able to take the, break the seal and open the scroll? Is anyone able? The Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave. He is David's root. David's root. That's Isaiah chapter 11. It's a prophecy about that. And the Lamb who died, Isaiah 53, 52, to ransom the slave. <laughs> is he worth, I'll click to the next one here. So the first service, I had a clicker, clicker held back there, but I like having some control of it. Is he worthy? Is he worthy of all blessing and honor and glory? Is he worthy of this? He certainly is. And then there's this one. And this might be where you're at today after the holidays, right? I made all that turkey and all that dressing, and nobody did the dishes with me. I had to, I had to take all that garbage out, and I'm going to have to turn around and do it all again for Christmas in just a couple of weeks. <laughs> Oh, my goodness. Woe is me. Woe is me. Does the Father truly love us? <laughs> Thank you. Does the Spirit move among us? He does. And does Jesus, our Messiah, hold forever those he loves? He does. Does our God intend to dwell with us? He does. What about this dwelling with us? We've got it in the book of Exodus, right? The people are going out of Egypt into the promised land. Well, what does God want to do besides give them moral law? He wants to dwell with them. So he wants them to build this tabernacle so God can dwell with them. So Emmanuel can happen, God with us. But it's not full because the full God with us is that barn, that animal feeder, or those pagan philosophers from Iran come and worship, and the shepherds get to bow down and worship as well. It's just, it's just amazing to me. Does God intend to dwell with us again? Yes, he does. And he will in the millennial kingdom. We will dwell with him in heaven, and we will dwell with him in the new heavens and the earth. If you know Jesus Christ, and if you don't, you really should. It's the best deal ever. You just give yourself, which is a great big nothing, to everything that he is. You just submit to his life joyfully and gladly, and he will come into you and begin dwelling with you now and take you home to glory. It's a wonderful, wonderful truth in this passage. It talks about it. From every people and tribe, from every nation and tongue, he has made us a kingdom and priest to God to reign with the Son. Is he worthy? Is he worthy? Is he worthy? He is. So there's that, that chiasm of uh, biblical history. But we also have one, I think, here. Uh, that's some stuff, fulfillment of Isaiah 53. Uh, might not have a creation, Paul. No. Uh, it's more prophecy. More prophecy. <laughs> we don't have time to preach this. It would be very fun if we did. Uh, here we go. You see the A on the top and the A on the bottom? The unsuc un unexpected success of the atonement. It goes out globally. It affects kings. 
it causes them to be quiet and to, to worship Christ. Then in from that, you have the atonement, our griefs, he's crushed. Then we have the simile of Jesus, the lamb, and we were the sheep that needed the atonement. And the atonement's right in the center of the, uh, it's, it's a chiastic structure. And we have a hope that doesn't disappoint. We have hope right down here on this little crush scene. I think we have faith and love over here. Um, but hope, Biblical hope is an expectation. It's a Greek word, elpis. It means it's going to happen. It's not like I hope the temperature tomorrow is 50 degrees like it is now, but no rain, so I can go outside and rake up that last vestiges of leaves and get the leaves out of my eaves, get that dirty job done before winter. And while it's still warm out, my hands don't get frostbite reaching into the eave spouts. You know, but you have no idea what the weather's going to be like tomorrow. You have no idea. But biblical hope does not disappoint. This gospel, this good news, is for real. I'm going to close with a couple of, of hymns. One of them is titled, Let God Be God. I don't like that title because I don't think we have to let God be anything because God is going to be who he is. But it's like recognize, let, recognize who he is. Let me read you just uh, three stanzas of this. This is a prayer. This is a prayer. And I think it's, a, you know, people talk about a sinner's prayer. This is one. This is one. It really kicks. It says, let God be God in this, our present moment. Let God be master, holding in control all parts of life as gifts of his bestowment for making us now broken, strong, and whole. Let God be God or we shall never finish the task to which he calls us every day, lest erring we in unbelief diminish the force, the power he wishes to display. Let Christ be Lord in all his risen power, his gracious spirit unsuppressed and free. O oh, Father, recreate us for this hour into the people you wish for us to be. Let this be ours as we await his coming. Back to the theme. To tell the world of him, our Lord and King. Oh, let us march to this, the distant drumming, which in crescendo soon will roar and ring. Let God be God, let Christ be King. Isn't that a great, great hymn of consecration, of yieldedness to him? I used to be on staff with an organization called InterVarsity Christian Fellowship before I was with Rosho Christie, which I'm now with still, and before I was with the Calvary Chapel Movement. <laughs> And we have this thing every three years, every student generation, called Urbana. It's supposed to be a student missions convention where students can find ways to use their training in the advancement of the world mission of the church. I'm sad to say that like a lot of different large evangelical events, this one has been influenced by a lot of political correctness and different cause celebs that come around from time to time. But every now and then stuff still cracks through, and this is one that cracked through. This is a hymn written for Urbana, and it's called Lord of the Universe, Hope of the World. And I want to read it to you because it's supreme worship, and we'll, we'll close with this. It says, Lord of the Universe, Hope of the World, Lord of the limitless reaches of space. Here on this planet, you put on our flesh, vastness confined in the womb of a maid. Born in our likeness, you ransomed our race. Savior, we worship you, praise and adore. Help us to honor you more and yet more. Verse two. Lord of the universe, hope of the world, Lord of the infinite eons of time, you came among us, lived our brief years, tasted our griefs, our aloneness, our fears, conquered our death, made eternity ours. Savior, we worship you, praise and adore. Help us to honor you more and yet more. Third verse. Lord of the universe, hope of the world, send out your light to the ends of the earth. May we who know you obey your command, go with your grace of your gospel to all, bringing salvation and freedom and joy. Savior, we worship you, praise and adore. Help us to honor you more and yet more. Last verse. Lord of the universe, hope of the world, how your creation cries out for release, looks for you, longs for you, watches and waits, prays for your kingdom of justice and peace. Maker, Redeemer, Triumphant One, come, Savior, we worship you, praise and adore. Help us to honor you more and yet more.